Has he followed you late at night, in your dreams, or in your mind? He is cunning, and he will lie in wait until he senses the time is right. Then, when you least expect it, he will pounce, taking your freedom, your confidence, your courage. Once he has you in his bite, he will control your life. He will make you do things you never thought you could or should. Those who have not met the black dog will not understand where you are or who you are and they will not know where to find you or your soul. You're listening to Carolina Haynes. season finale of the Carolina Haynes podcast, brought to you by Wreak Havoc Productions and A Darker World. I'm your host, Dan Sellers. Black dogs are one of those urban legend staples. Right up there with hitchhiking ghosts, gravity hills, and crybaby bridges. Pretty much every county and every state has their own black dog tale. The Carolinas are no different. Sometimes it's a dog, and sometimes it's an evil, demonic presence. But sometimes, it's a happy hound. We talked about the demon dog of Valley Crucis in Season 2. You may recall from that episode that the demon dog fits the classic black dog trope. The black dog motif has been described as, quote, a nocturnal apparition, in some cases a shapeshifter, and is often said to be associated with the devil, end quote. It's usually quite large and, more often than not, has glowing red eyes. So in this episode, we'll talk about some black dogs from neighboring states. And you'll find out that not all supernatural dogs are wild-eyed, snarling beasts intent on devouring your soul. Some are said to be kind. Some act as protectors. And some are guides to those lost in the wilderness. First, let's talk about one of the most famous paranormal pooches, who isn't even black. It's the Ghost Hound of Goshen. It all happened around 1850 on Old Buncombe Road in Goshen, South Carolina, what's now part of the Sumter National Forest between the towns of Newberry and Union. A traveling salesman was passing through the area with his dog. A big, white, friendly dog that was very loyal and obedient to its owner. About the same time, a murder took place in the community. The actual cause of death has been lost in time, but it was said to be particularly brutal. The people of Goshen knew right away who the killer was. Why, of course, it was the stranger in town. It had to be. None of them would have killed anyone. And certainly not in such a brutal and graphic way. There was no need for a trial. They knew he was guilty. They hired him down and drug him into the town square. The man screamed that he was innocent, even as the noose was pulled tight and his feet lifted off the ground kicking at nothing but air. Air that he could only kick, but not breathe. The big white dog sat nearby and howled as it watched the life leave its owner's body. The dog continued his baying and howling as it followed the group to a nearby makeshift grave. 
The hall was crude and shallow and hastily prepared. Old Buncombe Road was well away from the town cemetery, close to modern-day Interstate 26. But the townsfolk intended it that way. They wanted to be sure that once the grass grew back, the murdering salesman would be forgotten, erased from history. But the loyal white dog didn't forget. It came back night after night to the gravesite, whining and baying and howling for its owner to return. The dog was quite a nuisance to the neighbors. They tried repeatedly to run it off, but it kept returning again and again. They tried to catch it, but it wouldn't let anyone near it. It would dart off into the woods, and they, of course, came back later. At their wit's end, the townsfolk set a trap for the dog. They waited for it to begin its vigil, and then they carefully surrounded it with snares and nets, moving as quietly as they could. They subdued it and pinned it to the ground. They then stoned it to death right on top of its owner's grave. The dog didn't warn a grave. It was drug off and tossed into the woods beside Old Buncombe Road. Now, some of these details have been known to change depending on which version of the story you hear. In some versions, the traveling peddler himself was the victim of the heinous crime. One version has him being buried in a potter's field while his dog wasted away, starving to death at the burial spot. If you're a listener to this show, or at least a fan of folklore, having multiple versions of an old story like this shouldn't surprise you. Anyway, within a couple of years, the weeds took over the salesman's grave, and both he and the dog were forgotten. But by the mid-1850s, reports started coming in of a large, vicious, white dog attacking people out on Old Buncombe Road. Travelers along the road claimed that a big white dog would run out of the woods and chase their horses. A few of them struck the animal with their whips, but it passed right through the dog. Then, once they reached a certain point in the road, It would either slow to a steady walk or go back into the woods. Or it would simply vanish. The dog snapped and snarled and showed its teeth. And some reports even claimed that it had wild, glowing eyes. The dog had the town terrified. It chased anyone, horse and buggy, lone riders, even people traveling by foot. It was always hot on their heels, keeping pace. Now wait. If it could keep pace with a horse, then it could easily take down a person. If that's what it wanted. One local man, Dr. Cofield, surmised that it was actually a friendly dog. He thought that it was chasing people simply because they ran from it. He thought it was trying to play with them, not hurt them. To test his theory, he walked up and down Old Buncombe Road until the dog rushed out of the woods. It took all his will to stand his ground. The beast was, indeed, horrifying, with its large, toothy grin, its glowing red eyes locked on his, drool streaming from its snarling mouth. But he kept walking at the same leisurely pace, and when the dog got close to him, it slowed as well and peacefully walked alongside him. The doctor returned to the road frequently, and the dog always walked with him. He determined that the dog's range seemed to be about a five-mile stretch between Maybenton and Goshen Hill. Until the day he died, Dr. Cofield maintained that the Hound of Goshen was friendly and only wanted attention. Perhaps it's this theory, and maybe the wide, toothy grin, 
that led some folks to call him the Happy Hound of Goshen. However, very few people, if any, were as brave or foolhardy as Dr. Cofill. Everybody ran from the wild-looking beast, including a man named Jim Garrett. Jim encountered the dog in 1967. He had heard stories of the Hound of Goshen and knew that it was believed to be friendly. But those stories were the last thing on his mind when he saw the huge dog sprinting toward him. He ran. He ran as fast and as hard as he could. With the hound nipping at his heels, he ran and ran, and then he stumbled, tumbling and rolling, and finally coming to a stop right in the middle of the road. In that moment, his thoughts weren't on the pain in his limbs, but the sight of the dog stepping onto his chest, pinning him down. And then, Jim fainted. He awoke on the shoulder of the road, and there were traces of blood on his clothes and bite marks on his arm and neck. However, the bite marks were shallow, barely breaking the skin. Nonetheless, Jim Garrett believed wholeheartedly that the hound was intent on killing him that night. I'm sure Dr. Cofield would have said that the dog was merely playing, perhaps even protecting him by pulling him out of the middle of the road and onto the shoulder. There was also an elderly woman who encountered the dog. She was certainly too weak and frail to either run from the beast or to stand any chance of fighting it off. She, too, fainted as the dog closed in. However, when she awoke, she was completely unharmed and the dog was nowhere in sight. Nonetheless, she agreed with Jim Garrett's feelings on the whole matter. I will always believe that dog was an omen of death. And even now, I wouldn't care to walk that road alone at night. A deathbed confession came from a man 30 years after the lynching of the traveling salesman. The old man confessed to the grisly murder. Not only was the salesman innocent, but the old man had stood there and watched him hang for it. For a different, more traditional black dog tale, we turn to our neighbors to the north, at the westernmost pointy tip of Virginia. There are stories of a black dog that appears to the worst of sinners lying on their deathbeds. Some believe that the dog is Satan himself. It supposedly started in the early 1800s with an individual who was the worst of the worst. He was born wealthy and spoiled and psychotic. He would occasionally murder a random slave just to show others what would happen to him if they got out of line. To further humiliate them, he refused to allow them to bury the slain until they had finished their daily chores for his plantation. He was married at least five times, each one a very wealthy woman, and each one of them mysteriously died within a few months of marriage, leaving their possessions to him. Everyone in the area hated him, and eventually he grew old and weak and started to near death. His slaves and servants hid their smiles as they prepared his deathbed, but he refused to go quietly. He lasted longer than anyone thought possible as he clutched the sheets between his clenched fists and yelled at the ceiling, challenging God to show himself and explain why he had to die. Why was God taking everything from him that he had built? As the days passed, the man's rantings became more vile and sacrilegious, demanding that God show himself. But it was not God that visited that night. Shortly after midnight, 
When the old man had exhausted himself screaming and servants felt sure that he couldn't possibly make it to another morning, they heard a slow, methodical shuffling from the hallway. As it drew closer, the shuffling was accompanied by a sniffling and the click-clack of claws on the hardwood floor. A sense of dread and terror filled everyone in the room, and they all backed away from the door. Even the old man noticed the change, proclaiming triumphantly, So he's finally come. But what came through the door was an enormous black dog with glowing red eyes. It stood almost as tall as some of the women in the room. The dog ignored everyone, focusing all its attention on the old man. It slowly walked around to the foot of the bed, never taking its eyes off the old man. He recognized the animal for what it was. It's the devil come to take me. The dog reared up on its hind legs, nearly touching the ceiling, straddling the old man in his deathbed, staring down into his eyes. As the dog stood over him, his breathing became progressively slower and more shallow until it stopped completely. The dog then strode back out of the room as slowly as it had entered. Now we're going to do something a little different for Carolina Haynes. We're going to get back down to South Carolina before we end the season. We're going to hear from a friend of the show, Mr. Tally Johnson. Tally's not only a published author and paranormal researcher, but he's the leading authority on South Carolina folklore. He wrote about his first-hand experiences encountering the Hound of Goshen in his book, Ghosts of the South Carolina Upcountry. So I asked Tally to tell us in his own words what that was like. For the first one, you'll have to read the book. The last one, I ran into him coming back from a job interview at another haunted site, Rose Hill State Historic Site home of the secession governor of South Carolina, William Henry Gist. Um, coming back about 7 o'clock on an October evening, I um, had to pass the turn for the road that the house known to home. Made the turn, drove about a half mile, saw a flash of white through the pines, and here he came. He left me for, faced me for a good, oh, I don't know, Five minutes it seemed like. And then he just vanished into the mist he came from. To learn more about these stories, check out Haunted South Carolina Ghost and Strange Phenomena of the Palmetto State by Alan Brown. There's Legends and Lores of South Carolina by Sherman Carmichael. South Carolina Ghosts from the Coast to the Mountains by Nancy Roberts. Best Ghost Tales of South Carolina by Terrence Zepke. And of course, Ghosts of the South Carolina Upcountry by Tally Johnson. This episode was researched and written by Jeffrey Cochran. It was produced and hosted by me, Dan Sellers. You can find everything that Jeff's up to at adarkerworld.com and you can learn everything that we're up to at wreakhavocproductions.com Special thanks to Joan Schurmeyer and Sammy Castle for their additional vocal talents to this episode and a very special thanks to Tally Johnson for sharing his own encounter with the Hound of Goshen. You can find the Carolina Haynes podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Or you can listen directly from the feed at carolinahaynes.libson.com. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash carolinahaints. I'm on Twitter at Hank vs. the Undead, 
and we're on Instagram at Breed Cabin Productions. Be sure to pick up your copy of our book, Carolina Haints, Ghost, Folklore, and Mysteries of the Old North State, in bookstores and libraries today. As always, you can find everything about Carolina Haints at our official website, carolinahaints.com. If you're a fan of this show, do us a favor. Leave us a review and share the show with your friends. Everybody's got that friend that loves creepy stories. As always, you can send us your questions, comments, or concerns to recapitproductions at gmail.com. This show marks the end of the fifth season of the Carolina Haints podcast. I hope you've enjoyed listening to these episodes as much as we've enjoyed making them. We'll return with Season 6 of the Carolina Haynes Podcast in September 2022. Tune in then to hear more about those things that go bump in the night.